As the witching hour looms closer, so does our very first reading of the Midnight Book. Tonight, I foresee tales of imaginary monsters and ballads of burning witches. When both arms point towards the sky, join us. My name is Vander Von Odd, and this is the very first reading of the Midnight Book. point towards the sky, a dozen chimes the clock will cry. In the vessel boil and bake, wolfling's claw and tongue of snake, thimble of a seamstress dead, hangman's noose and ribbons red, ashes of a burning witch, coffin dust and black of pitch, rusted keys of haunted homes, Stir the pot with dead man's bones. Now deep within the cauldron look, and find the dreadful midnight book. Fear is primal. It transcends decades, centuries, millennia. You learn to laugh and you learn to love, but fear is within all of you from the moment you are born. Conjured forth and trapped inside this binding is an ever-growing collection of my most treasured horror stories and poems from the last 300 years. I'd like to dig within the pages of the Midnight Book and exhume the tales of generations past. Some will be recognizable classics, others are long forgotten gems, but every story is a horrifying love letter to our lifelong companion, fear. Tonight's story is one of my absolute favorites. I first read it in a very old paperback issue of Weird Tales magazine that my father gifted me when I was a small child. It's the story of a mother and a father, and their struggle to rid their only son of his irrational lifelong fear of their cellar. Join us for tonight's midnight reading of David H. Keller's 1932 story, the thing in the cellar. It was a large cellar, entirely out of proportion to the house above it. The owner admitted that it was probably built for a distinctly different kind of structure from the one which rose above it. Probably the first house had been burned, and poverty had caused a diminution of the dwelling erected to take its place. A winding stone staircase connected the cellar with the kitchen. Around the base of this series of steps, successive owners of the house had placed their firewood, winter vegetables, and junk. The junk had gradually been pushed back till it rose head high in a barricade of uselessness. What was back of that barricade, no one knew, and no one cared. For some hundreds of years, no one had crossed it to penetrate to the black reaches of the cellar behind it. At the top of the steps, separating the kitchen from the cellar, was a stout oaken door. This door was, in a way, as peculiar and out of relation to the rest of the house as the cellar. It was a strange kind of door to find in a modern house, and certainly a most unusual door to find in the inside of a house. Thick, stoutly built, dexterously rabbited together with huge wrought iron hinges, and a lock that looked as though it came from castle despair. Separating a house from the outside world, such a door would be excusable. Swinging between kitchen and cellar, it seemed peculiarly inappropriate. 
From the earliest months of his life, Tommy Tucker seemed unhappy in the kitchen. In the front parlor, in the formal dining room, and especially on the second floor of the house, he acted like a normal, healthy child. But carry him to the kitchen, he at once began to cry. His parents, being plain people, ate in the kitchen save when they had company. Being poor, Mrs. Tucker did most of her work, though occasionally she had a charwoman in to do the extra Sunday cleaning, and thus much of her time was spent in the kitchen. And Tommy stayed with her, at least as long as he was unable to walk. Much of the time, he was decidedly unhappy. When Tommy learned to creep, he lost no time in leaving the kitchen. No sooner was his mother's back turned than the little fellow crawled as fast as he could for the doorway opening into the front of the house, the dining room, and the front parlor. Once away from the kitchen, he seemed happy. At least he ceased to cry. On being returned to the kitchen, his howls so thoroughly convinced the neighbors that he had colic that more than one bowl of catnip and sage tea was brought to his assistance. It was not until the boy learned to talk that the Tuckers had any idea as to what made the boy cry so hard when he was in the kitchen. It was not until the boy learned to talk that the Tuckers had any idea as to what made the boy cry so hard when he was in the kitchen. In other words, the baby had to suffer for many months till he obtained at least a little relief. And even when he told his parents what was the matter, they were absolutely unable to comprehend. This is not to be wondered at because they were both hard-working, rather simple-minded persons. What they finally learned from their little son was this. That if the cellar door was shut and securely fastened with the heavy iron, Tommy could at least eat a meal in peace. If the door was simply closed and not locked, he shivered with fear but kept quiet. But if the door was open, even if the slightest creak of black showed that it was not tightly shut, then the little three-year-old would scream himself to the point of exhaustion, especially if his tired father would refuse him permission to leave the kitchen. Playing in the kitchen, the child developed two interesting habits. Rags, scraps of paper, and splinters of wood were continually being shoved under the thick oak door to fill the space between the door and the sill. Whenever Mrs. Tucker opened the door, there was always some trash there placed by her son. It annoyed her, and more than once the little fellow was thrashed for his misconduct. But punishment acted in no way as a deterrent. The other habit was as singular. Once the door was closed and locked, he would rather boldly walk over to it and caress the old lock. Even when he was so small that he had to stand on his tiptoe to touch it with the tips of his fingers, he would still touch it with slow, caressing strokes. Later on, as he grew, he used to kiss it. His father, who only saw the boy at the end of the day, decided that there was no sense in such conduct and in his masculine way tried to break the lad of his foolishness. There was, of necessity, no effort on the part of the hard-working man to understand the psychology back of his son's conduct. All that the man knew was that his little son was acting in a way that was decidedly queer. Tommy loved his mother and was willing to do anything he could to help her in the household chores, but one thing he would not do, and never did do, and that was to fetch and carry between the house and the cellar. If his mother opened the door, he would run, screaming from the room, and he never returned voluntarily till he was assured that the door was closed. He never explained just why he acted as he did. In fact, he refused to talk about it, at least to his parents, and that was just as well, because had he done so, they would simply have been more positive than ever that there was something wrong with their only child. They tried, in their own ways, to break the child of his unusual habits. Failing to change him at all, they decided to ignore his peculiarities. That is, 
They ignored them till he became six years old and the time came for him to go to school. He was a sturdy little chap by that time and more intelligent than the usual boys beginning in the primer class. Mr. Tucker was, at times, proud of him. The child's attitude towards the cellar door was the one thing most disturbing to his father's pride. Finally, nothing would do but that the Tucker family call on the neighborhood physician. It was an important event in the life of the Tuckers, so important that it demanded the wearing of Sunday clothes and all that sort of thing. The matter is just this, Dr. Hawthorne, said Mr. Tucker in a somewhat embarrassed manner. Our little Tommy is old enough to start school, but he behaves childish in regard to our cellar. And the missus and I thought you could tell us what to do about it. It must be his nerves. Ever since he was a baby, continued Mrs. Tucker, taking up the thread of the conversation where her husband had paused, Tommy has had a great fear of the cellar. Even now, big boy that he is, he does not love me enough to fetch and carry for me through that door and down those steps. It is not natural for a child to act like he does. And what with the chinking the cracks with rags and kissing the lock, he drives me to the point where I fear he may become daft-like as he grows older. The doctor, eager to satisfy new customers and dimly remembering some lectures on the nervous system received when he was a medical student, asked some general questions, listened to the boy's heart, examined his lungs and looked at his eyes and fingernails. At last he commented, Looks like a fine, healthy boy to me. Yes, I'll accept the cellar door, replied the father. Has he ever been sick? Not but fits once or twice when he cried himself blue in the face, answered the mother. Frightened? Perhaps. It was always in the kitchen. Suppose you go out and let me talk to Tommy by myself. And there sat the doctor very much at his ease and the little six-year-old boy very uneasy. Tommy, what is there in the cellar you are afraid of? I don't know. Have you ever seen it? No, sir. Ever heard it? Smelt it? No, sir. Then how do you know there is something there? Because. Because what? Because there is. That was as far as Tommy would go, and at last his seeming abstinency annoyed the physician even as it had for several years annoyed Mr. Tucker. He went to the door and called the parents into the office. He thinks there is something down in the cellar, he stated. The Tuckers simply looked at each other. That's foolish, commented Mr. Tucker. It's just a plain cellar with junk and firewood and cider barrels in it, added Mrs. Tucker. Since we moved into that house, I have not missed a day without going down those stone steps, and I know there is nothing there. But the lad has always screamed when the door was open. I recall now that since he was a child in arms, he always screamed when the door was open. He thinks there is something there, said the doctor. That is why we brought him to you, replied the father. It's the child's nerves. Perhaps Fotida or something will calm him. I'll tell you what to do, advised the doctor. He thinks there is something there. Just as soon as he finds out he is wrong and that there is nothing there, he will forget about it. He has been humored too much. What you want to do is open that cellar door and make him stay by himself in the kitchen. Nail the door open so he cannot close it. Leave him alone there for an hour and then go and laugh at him and show him how silly it was for him to be afraid of an empty cellar. I will give you some nerve and blood tonic and that will help, but the big thing is to show him that there is nothing to be afraid of. On the way back to the Tucker home, Tommy broke away from his parents. They caught him after an exciting chase and kept him between them the rest of the way home. Once in the house, he disappeared and was found in the guest room under the bed. The afternoon being already spoiled for Mr. Tucker, 
he determined to keep the child under his observation for the rest of the day. Tommy ate no supper, in spite of the urgings of the unhappy mother. The dishes were washed, the evening paper read, the evening pipe smoked, and then, and only then, did Mr. Tucker take down his toolbox and get out a hammer and some long nails. And I am going to nail the door open, Tommy, so you cannot close it, as that is what the doctor said. Tommy and you are to be a man and stay here in the kitchen alone for an hour, and I will be leaving the lamp a-burning. And then, when you find there is not to be afraid of, you will be well and a real man, and not something for a man to be ashamed of being the father of. But at the last, Mrs. Tucker kissed Tommy and cried and whispered to her husband not to do it and to wait till the boy was larger. But nothing was to do except to nail the thick door open so it could not be shut and leave the boy there alone with the lamp burning and the dark open space of the doorway to look at with eyes that grew as hot and burning as the flame of the lamp. That same day, Dr. Hawthorne took supper with a classmate of his, a man who specialized in psychiatry and who was particularly interested in children. Hawthorne told Johnson of his newest case, the little Tucker boy, and asked him for his opinion. Johnson frowned. Children are odd, Hawthorne. Perhaps they are like dogs. It may be their nervous system is more acute than in the adult. We know that our eyesight is limited, also our hearing and smell. I firmly believe that there are forms of life which exist in such a form that we can neither see, hear, nor smell them. Fondly, we delude ourselves into the fallacy of believing that they do not exist because we cannot prove their existence. This Tucker lad may have a nervous system that is particularly acute. He may dimly appreciate the existence of something that's in the cellar, which is unappreciable to his parents. Evidently, there is some basis to this fear of his. Now, I'm not saying that there is anything in the cellar. In fact, I suppose that it is just an ordinary cellar. But this boy, since he was a baby, has thought that there was something there. And that is just as bad as though there actually were. What I would like to know is what makes him think so. Give me the address and I will call tomorrow and have a talk with the little fellow. What do you think of my advice? Sorry, old man, but I think it was perfectly rotten. If I were you, I would stop around there on my way home and prevent them from following it. The little fellow may be badly frightened. You see, he evidently thinks there is something there. But there isn't. Perhaps not. No doubt he is wrong, but he thinks so. It all worried Dr. Hawthorne so much that he decided to take his friend's advice. It was a cold night, a foggy night, and the physician felt cold as he tramped along the London streets. At last he came to the Tucker house. He remembered now that he had been there once before, long ago, when little Tommy Tucker came into the world. There was a light in the front window, and in no time at all, Mr. Tucker came to the door. I have come to see Tommy, said the doctor. He is back in the kitchen, replied the father. He gave one cry, but since then he has been quiet, sobbed the wife. If I had let her have her way, she would have opened the door, but I said to her, Mother, now is the time to make a man of our Tommy. And I guess he knows by now that there was not to be afraid of. Well, the hour is up. Suppose we go and get him and put him to bed. It has been a hard time for the little child, whispered the wife. Carrying the candle, the man walked ahead of the woman and the doctor, and at last opened the kitchen door. The room was dark. Lamp has gone out, said the man. Wait till I light it. Tommy? Tommy? called Mrs. Tucker. But the doctor ran to where a white form was stretched out on the floor. Sharply, he called for more light. Trembling, 
he examined all that was left of little Tommy. Twitching, he looked into the open space down into the cellar. At last, he looked at Tucker and Tucker's wife. Tommy. Tommy's been hurt. I guess he's dead. He stammered. The mother threw herself on the floor and picked up the torn, mutilated thing that had been only a little while ago, her little Tommy. The man took his hammer and drew out the nails and closed the door and locked it, and then drove in a long spike to reinforce the lock. Then he took hold of the doctor's shoulders and shook him. What killed him, doctor? What killed him? He shouted into Hawthorne's ear. The doctor looked at him bravely in spite of the fear in his throat. How do I know, Tucker? He replied. How do I know? Didn't you tell me there was nothing there? Nothing down there? In the cellar. Not all monsters hunt indiscriminately. Sometimes they crave a very specific kind of flesh. David H. Keller's The Thing in the Cellar has been a longtime favorite of mine. For me, in almost every way, it parallels the queer experience and the dangers that at times only we can perceive. It's a cautionary reminder that sometimes those who love us can harm us the most. Closing tonight's midnight reading, I'd like to share with you a tale of scorch and scorn in verse. This is a poem by Mary Elizabeth Councilman titled Witch Burning. They burned a witch in Bingham Square last Friday afternoon. The faggot smoke was blacker than the shadows on the moon. The licking flames were strangely green, like fox fire on the fen. And she who cursed the godly folk will never curse again. They burned a witch in Bingham Square before the village gate. A huswife raised a skinny hand to damn her tents with hate. A huckster threw a jagged stone, her pallid cheek ran red. But there was something scornful in the way she held her head. They burned a witch in Bingham Square, her eyes were terror wild. She was a slight, a comely maid, no taller than a child. They bound her fast against the stake and laughed to see her fear. Her red lips muttered secret words that no one dared to hear. They burned a witch in Bingham Square, but ere she swooned with pain, and ere her bones were sodden in ash beneath the sudden rain. She set her mark upon that throng, for time cannot erase. The echo of her anguished cries, the memory of her face. As the witching hour comes to a close, so does our very first reading of the Midnight Book. Should the insatiable being that lives in the cellar follow you home, remember this. Through darkness unending and horrors so vile, leave here living fearlessly and when both arms point towards the sky, find me in the shadows. Good night.